Well, good morning, everyone. I'm over on the side by the piano. See me? Wave at me. There you go. All right. We're going to have a great time of worship. This is, uh, this is Memorial Day weekend, and I think I can say you've probably never been to a service quite like we're going to have this morning, so I'm excited that we're here to worship. I want to say welcome to those of you who are visiting. We do have some guests. Thank you for being here, and we're glad that you're here. Uh, we're going to... Gail Hurd is ill today, so I'm going to lead worship from the piano, and you're going to sing just as well as you would as if I was up there singing it, okay? So we're going to have a great time, beginning with the choir singing a special called Redeemed. Choir? you to sing along with us here a congregational song and it is called majesty let's stand as we sing this song together Sing so exalt.
be seated. And as you're seated, I'll let you know that Stephen Mosco is going to sing that. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much. Man, wonderful song there. So I appreciate that. Soon we'll have our men quartet come up here. So quartet with three men. I guess, David, you're singing with the quartet in a little bit. So uh, we're so glad you're here at worship today. Always exciting to be here. Today is Memorial Day weekend. So I'm going to take a moment right now. We're going to recognize those that have given their life for our country. And maybe uh, you're, you're, you have a family member. And we're going to ask you to stand if you have a family member who's passed away. You know, we live in a wonderful country, and we are blessed for the freedom we have here in the United States. But it, uh, many people paid the ultimate price 
for those who have get, uh, given their life for our freedom. So what we're going to do is I am going to ask you, if you had a family member who died for our country, will you stand up? That's what, what we celebrate for Memorial Day. If you all look around the room, these are the, these are the folks here that have lost family members for our country. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to remain standing because I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I'm going to tell you what I'm going to pray for here. It's going to be based out of se- uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 55. The very first person who died for their faith in the New Testament was a deacon named Stephen. And the Bible says in Acts 7.55 that Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. He gazed up. He was about to get stoned to death. And he looked up in the air. And heaven opened and he saw the Lord. Jesus was actually standing at the right hand of God. That is the only time in the Bible where we see Jesus not sitting, but standing at the right hand of God. So what it is, is all the other times he's seated. And I believe the reason he was standing is because he was, that was the very first Christian martyr. He was, Jesus was giving his approval for what Stephen was doing, willing to die for what he believed in. And we are thankful for those that have died for our freedom. So as I read this, why don't we all stand as I read this? Let's all stand together along with those that are standing for Memorial Day. And I'm going to lead us in a prayer for our country and for the families that have lost loved ones. Lord, this is Memorial Day weekend. And Lord, we thank you for our freedom. Lord, we're able to come into this wonderful church, wonderful sanctuary, and worship you. Lord, there are many families here that have lost loved ones in in the service to our country. Lord, signing up and being drafted into the military in many ways means uh, paying the ultimate cost, which is their life. And Lord, we pray for the families this weekend as we remember. And Lord, we are thankful for those that, have, uh, that are protecting our freedom right now and who are dying right now for our freedom. Lord, we thank you for our country. Lord, we also thank you for men like Stephen, the very first martyr in the New Testament. He gave his life so we could, as Christians, see as an example of what it means to stand for you, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you are standing in, in heaven, giving approval for his death. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful church, all of the folks here as we worship you. And Lord, we thank you that we get to remember here on Memorial Day weekend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. All right. Well, today is the Sunday before Memorial Day. And as we think of America... There are so many songs that represent America, and I'm not talking about religious songs particularly, but, um, you know, think of how times have changed since, I know since I was young, The Sound of Music. You all remember that musical? All right, that's, a, that's, that's so much different than the movies of today. <laughs> you know, and, and Gilligan's Island, you remember that? How many of you remember Gilligan's Island? All right. That's, that was the entertainment, and it was funny. It was good. It was really good back then. Well, I'm going to play a little medley of songs that sort of celebrate the songs of America. And I know that as we are grateful for our country, grateful for those who have served, and grateful for those who have given the ultimate sacrifice for our country. But we have a wonderful country, from New York to California and all in between. And my medley is going to end up with a little bit of New Orleans because that's one of my favorite spots, okay? The music of New Orleans is like none other. But uh, I'm going to share this with you, and then we'll continue worship. We're going to start, though, by singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, just one verse. And I'm going to ask you to sing it with me. Let's sing together. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Hallelujah, our God is marching.
Another great hymn about America is My Country Tis of Thee. We're going to sing one verse. I'm going to ask the ushers to come as we sing. Would you stand, please? My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers are, land of the pilgrims, from every mountain side, let freedom ring. Brother Mike is going to lead us in prayer. Part of our great heritage in America is being able to worship as we please. And I know I grew up in a Christian home. I was so blessed to have Christian parents. On this Memorial Day weekend, we very uh, rightfully acknowledge and remember those who have gone before us in service who have been uh, killed in military service. But Memorial Day is more than that. It's more than just the military. It's more, it, it includes all of our uh, relatives, many times lost relatives, folks who have gone before us and led the way, those who have been meaningful to us, those who have been our mentors or our parents, grandparents, aunts or uncles, friends, church friends, Sunday school teachers. God has blessed me with a great history of folks who have influenced my life. I've asked four individuals this morning to share about someone on this Memorial Day weekend, who has been a great ministry to them. Lena Cornett is going to be first. And where are you, Lena? You come right down to that microphone, if you will. If it's too tall, you just pull it down because it comes down real easy. Lena's going to share, and then we have uh, some others who will follow her. Just p push down on it. Push down. There you go. That did it. All right.
has a legacy of love and faith in the Lord and will never forget it. She will. She was a sweet lady. In 2014, she passed away. She had kidney cancer and uh, she struggled with that for a little bit, but um, she loved all of us. The moral of the story, you never know who you're going to impact, whether it's your kids, your grandkids. Um, make time for them. You never know who you're going to touch. Uh, if your kids live far away, do what you can to be with them. Um, anyhow, Granny Carey. Good job. Thank you. <clears throat> well, most of you know me. I'm Judy Young. Um, my memory starts with my grandmother, Hallie Eve. My grandmother was a good Christian in church every Sunday. And on the weekends, I would go and spend with her every chance I could get because she was my best friend and my second mom. I remember her because she always had this pitcher full of ice-cold sweet tea. And at six and seven years old, I'm, Memo, I want tea, I want tea. Well, I inherited her pitcher just a few years ago. I didn't even know where it went. And I still make her recipe of sweet tea in here to remember her. This is over 100 years old. But my most memorable time is on those weekends that I spent with my mamma, as I called her. We would huddle up on Saturday night on the couch, and she'd pull out her Bible. And she would read it to me, and she would tell me about Jesus. Because I lived in a home where my parents didn't go to church. Without her, I wouldn't have known about Jesus. Then on Sunday morning, we put on our Sunday best, and we trotted off to church. And me being a person that loved music, the music touched my soul. And I love church. But you know, being raised in a home where you didn't get taken to church, God brought me a grandmother that loved me enough that she told me about Jesus. And I'm the woman today that I am with my Lord and my walk with him because of her. And that's my memories. Thank you. Well, I've been very fortunate in my near 80 years of life. The Lord has placed numerous people in my life that were very special, that have made contributions that would take the rest of the day for me to, to talk about. But when asked if I would do this this morning, it became quite clear that the person that I would like to memorialize this morning and speak about is the lady that gave me life. Uh, she was known as Miss Margie. She was known as Mama Smith, and she was my mother. She was, as some of you have heard me testify before, she was for me the examples of walking the Christian life that people talk about. She was a living, breathing example of what I would like to be. I'm the oldest of her five children. And her greatest contribution, the five of us agree, is that she taught us first to love the Lord. She taught us to love one another. And she taught us to love the people that God had placed in our lives. And she was a living example of how that love was to be demonstrated. She sang in the choir of the First Baptist Church of Smithfield, Tennessee. That's my way on from time to time. <laughs> she sang in that choir for over 40 years. She taught Sunday school for 35 years, and they were all little people. 
pages 6 to 10. You know, when you, when you speak of a ministry or a testimony, her ministry continued for 45 years because as those little people grew and they graduated high school and they moved to college, my mother spent the next 40 years of her life, beginning with that first child, writing notes and letters to those kids as they went to college and as they entered young adulthood. And she did that for all of those years for we couldn't count how many children and young people she had written to over the years. And at her passing, at her funeral and at the visitation, I was truly taken by how many young people came and wanted to share a story of how a note from my mother or a letter had shown up in their mailbox box at a very timely time in their lives and how important it had been. I give thanks to the Lord for placing that woman in my life and for deciding to choose her as my mom. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> One of the things that sort of rings true with all four testimonies is those who have invested in our lives, it then becomes our responsibility to invest in the lives of others. And we're fortunate, so fortunate, to live in a country where we can share without any fear of uh, any kind that we can share the love of Jesus with others. And God's put that in our responsibility to do that as life continues. We're going to uh, have a quartet sing, and this is a beautiful song called America the Beautiful. Thank you, men. Thank you so much. Wonderful song. It is America the Beautiful. 
I tell you, what wonderful testimonies there, memorializing those that have meant so much in our life. Lena, Nathan, Judy, and Jack, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Powerful stories of what the Lord, how the Lord has shaped you in, in your younger years, and you, we certainly do remember those who are loved ones. Miss Haley, will you stand up here? Parents, we have what we call Children's Church. If you are a child through about fifth grade, you'll want to stand up and follow Miss Haley right here to Children's Church if you want them to go that. Then right when Children's Church is over, they will go straight into Sunday school. So all the little children at this time want to stand up and go to Children's Church. For those of us upstairs in Big Church, we want to open up our Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, that's what we're going to be looking at today. We are on the second of a third part sermon series looking at David's advisors, his spiritual advisors, and that would be Samuel, that was last week. Today we're going to look at a gentleman named Nathan, and then next week we're going to look at a man who a lot of us don't know a lot about, his name is Gad, but that's next Sunday. Also next Sunday during our second service, we're going to have baptism. We've got three folks who are waiting to get baptized, and if you need to get baptized, you need to let me know. That will be at the 1115 service Next week, you can join our group. It's always exciting to baptize new believers and as people follow Jesus. So that will be next week as well, uh, coming up with that. Last week with Samuel, we saw how Samuel anointed David. Young David was anointed, and right after he was anointed, it didn't take long that he was on the run from King Saul. Saul's a very jealous man. Today, we see a man named Nathan. Nathan first met David. He had three encounters with David. And he first met David because David uh, was very successful as a king of Israel. And God was blessing David. And God had placed on his heart that he needed to build. Here he sat in this nice uh, palace. And he looked out the window and he saw the Lord's temple was a tent. The Lord lived in a tent and David lived in a nice palace. And he thought to himself, why am I in this nice palace? Why well, the Lord's living in a portable tent, the tent of meeting. It just moved around. And he placed in his heart that he wanted to build the Lord a temple. Well, then Nathan the prophet showed up and says, no, that's not what the Lord said. David, you're not the one who's going to build the temple. You can start getting the supplies ready to build the temple. But the, your descendant Solomon, your son, he's going to be the one who's going to build the temple. And God even made a statement that I will build you as a house. You want to build me a house, but no, David, I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to build the house of David, and it will be one that continues forever. And the house of David does continue forever through Jesus. That's because Jesus was from the lineage of David. So that was that first meeting there in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 9. The second meeting that he had with Nathan is what we're going to focus on today. And what occurred in 2 Samuel chapter 11, David was a very successful king. And probably when he was in his 50s or 60s, he uh, one day decided that was springtime. So what do you do in the springtime? Yesterday, Sherry and I planted flowers. But back in David's time, uh, you would go to war. So I guess that's what you do. You just time to go fight a battle. Well, David was getting to be an older man. And some of you might know when you become an older man, you're thinking, you know, I've been fighting a long time. It's time for to take a nap. I just want to take it easy and watch football. And, or I guess springtime, not football. Watch baseball. That'll put you asleep. Watch baseball during the spring. And just kind of do nothing. So he did that one day. And he was restless at night. So he got up. He was walking around on his temple palace, and he looked out, and there was a gorgeous lady named Bathsheba taking a bath. And he sent his servants to inquire about her. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And they reported back, says, this is Uriah's husband, who this lady is married. Her name is Bathsheba. And then he told his servants, he says, well, go get her and bring her to me. So he pretty much demanded, he, he, he forced this woman, he sent his servants, says, I want her in my palace. He had sexual relations with her, sent her back home that night, next, I guess, week or so, whenever, two weeks later, she reports to him that she's expecting a baby, which would cause problems for David. Her husband's away. All the servants know that David brought her into the palace that one night. And so then he brings in Uriah, her husband, 
and uh, says, why don't you go home? Uriah is actually a noble man. Uriah doesn't go home. He's like, how can I go home when my commander, Joab, is out fighting? I'm just going to sleep on the ground. So he doesn't even go. The man doesn't even go in his house. So he sleeps on the ground. So then the next, it's reported to David the next night, hey, Uriah didn't go to his house. I'm sure the servants realize what's going on here. They want it to look like the baby is not David's, but the baby is going to be Uriah. So Uriah just needed to spend one night at his house. So the next night, David invites him to a party, gets Uriah drunk. Uriah is the most noble of all drunk men to ever live on earth. Even drunk, Uriah does not go in his house. He sleeps on the ground out by at the foot of David's door. I mean, he's a noble drunk man. So this is causing a problem for David. Uriah will not go home. So then David's like, all right, Uriah, I'm going to write you a note. You give it to Joab. The note says, Joab, kill Uriah. Make sure he's at the most fiercest part of the battle, then have the Troops pull away, leave him exposed, and make sure he dies. And the Bible tells us several, quite a few men died, including Uriah. So David had Uriah killed. Uriah is such a noble man, he's actually carrying back to Joab, his commander, his death papers. And he carries it and hands it to Joab. It has the king's seal on it. And it's actually telling him to die. And then we're going to pick up here. So what's happened then Uriah has died? David then take, takes Bathsheba as his wife, and then there she's expecting a baby. And then I want you to look in your Bible. This is when we're going to pick up. And this is when Nathan the prophet is going to bust on the scene after this sad incident that occurred. So we're in, I want to read the very last verse of chapter 11. 2 Samuel eleven twenty seven. Bible tells us here, <clears throat> Actually, I want to pick up in verse 26. When Uriah's wife heard, that's Bathsheba, that her husband Uriah had died, she mourned for him. She might not have known at this point that it was actually David who had him killed. She, who knows? She might have never known. We have no idea. When the time of mourning ended, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. Now, this child will die, this little baby. Now, look at this sentence right here. Don't miss this one sentence because this sets up the entire fall. In many ways, this is the beginning of the end of David's kingdom right here. At this point, after what just occurred with David and Bathsheba, and then David having Uriah killed, so you think about the sins David committed. Adultery. Theft, he stole another man's wife, and murder. He made sure that Uriah, and the Bible actually said other men died too, so several soldiers died because of David's sin. David was not out at the battle. He was out of position. He should have been in bed. He should have been out fighting with his soldiers. But he was at home, idle, bored, nothing to do, and just finding himself uh, sinning against the Lord. And it says here, the last sentence of chapter 11, however, because what happens never gets past the Lord. The Lord knows everything. However, <clears throat> the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. There it is. David, what you did is evil. You, did, you made a mistake. So God does not allow evil to just go unpunished. There are consequences. And especially for King David, who is known to be a righteous man, who is known to be a man after the Lord's own heart. So look what happens here. So now we're going to pick up with our spiritual advisor, Nathan. We're going to read 14, 15 verses here. Chapter 12, verse 1. So the Lord sent Nathan the, to David. When he arrived, he said to him, this is probably the next day. You know, the Lord doesn't wait. He's right on the spot. Next thing, knock, knock, knock. Here's at the door. Nathan the prophet shows up, and David's probably thinking, well, this is good news, because the last time I saw you, you told me my kingdom was going to be an everlasting, eternal kingdom, and the Lord was going to make a house out of me. He was going to build a house of David. So now here he is again. And he tells him this story. He's standing at the door. There were two men in a certain city, one rich and another poor. The rich man had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except 
one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her, and she grew, grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food, she would eat. From his cup, she would drink. And in his arms, she would sleep. I, sadly, your pastor sleeps with a cat on top. Who else here has animals that when you go to bed, you have an animal on top of you? Look at that, Sherry. Some hands went up. I'm right there in that group. I have a cat that sleeps on top of me. This small little ewe lamb, every night, this cat's on top of me. She's lucky she's a kitten at this point, not a cat yet. This little sheep would sleep with this man. I mean, they love this little lamb. What a precious little animal. The children loved it. They would eat off the plate at the house. Luckily, our, children, our animals don't eat off the table. But this little ain't off the table. I mean, just a, a wonderful animal right here. And it says here, in, in her arms she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man. But the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for this guest. That means this, there's contrast. Rich man, poor man. Traveler shows up at rich man's house. He had plenty of sheep he could have taken. But instead, he went to the poor man, the helpless person, and said, you know, I'm going to steal your lamb from you. And I'm going to kill your lamb. And I'm going to prepare it as food for these guests over here. I mean, just took advantage of the poor man. And the poor man had no defense. Bathsheba could not have said no. Uriah is helpless. They are up against King David. King David just took this man's wife for himself. She could not have pushed back. This, poor, this rich man had all the resources and ability to steal this little lamb from this poor man. What a sad story. It's a story of a theft. It's a story of taking advantage of the poor man. And then you're killing the little lamb. The lamb was their favorite thing. They loved this little, little animal. It's a sad story, isn't it? Well, let's see what happens here. And David, what's amazing, I mean, we're, Nathan's standing on his front porch telling this story. And Nathan's standing there thinking, well, my goodness, what a sad story. You wonder, does Nathan at this point realize what the story's really about? This story is not about a rich man and a poor man. It's about David. It's about what he did to Uriah in Bathsheba. He's, he harmed them. He hurt them. He stole from them. He murdered them. And then it says, David was infuriated with the man. And said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die because he has done this thing and showed no pity. He must pay four lambs for that lamb. David's saying, well, we need to murder that rich man. In fact, he is so guilty, he needs to give that, that poor man four lambs. And that's the Old Testament law. If you take someone or steal someone's lamb, you're to pay four so David even knew the law. He knew his Old Testament. He knew what Moses had commanded. The proper payment was four lambs for stealing a lamb. But that's not what this is about. This, is, this fictional story isn't about the lambs. Nathan is now going to reveal that it's not about a rich man, poor man. David, it's about, look at this, Nathan replied to David. This is one of the most powerful statements in the Bible right here. Look at your Bibles if you have this. Verse 7. Nathan the prophet looks at David and says, you are the man. David, it's you. It's not. It's this, this story I just told isn't about something that happened. It's about what you did. You're the one who's guilty. You just sentenced yourself to death. You just sentenced yourself to payment for killing Uriah and stealing Bathsheba. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. Now, now look at this. God is reminding David of who he is. This is why we don't ever want to sin against the Lord. Everything we have comes from God. Our being, our families, our wonderful country, 
those that have given their lives from our freedom so we can live here. It's a blessing. Our salvation of going to heaven, it comes from the Lord. Look what, look what Nathan, who, who's speaking on behalf of the Lord, said to David. I anointed you king of Israel. You know who gave that anointing? It was Samuel. He's reminding you, David, you were anointed, not because you were a righteous man. You, you weren't blessed because you did a great job. You were, you were so far at the bottom when your dad invited people to the sacrifice. When Samuel came, you didn't get an invitation. We had to wait to go pull you out of the fields tending sheep. The anointing came from the Lord. It came from Samuel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from Saul. The only reason you're alive only is because the Lord protected David. It wasn't because of his skill. Saul was going to kill him. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. And I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that was not enough, I would have given you even more. I mean, David, if you needed anything, I, the Lord, would have given it to you. David's reminding. If he, if he needed something, he could have cried and called out to the Lord, and the Lord would have gave it. He didn't have to steal Bathsheba and kill Uriah. That's theft. And it goes on to say, Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I consider evil? Don't miss that. That's going back to the Ten Commandments. The, the sixth commandment is thou shalt not murder. The seventh commandment is thou shalt not commit adultery. The eighth commandment is thou shalt not steal. David committed all three of those commandments. The sin was against the Lord. Folks, when we sin, when we do something wrong, the true victim is God. He is the one who's hurt in this situation. This is his Lord's anointed, the king of Israel. He's known as the man after the Lord's own heart, who's referred to as righteous. Why is this man doing this? Righteous people should not be doing this. Nathan is standing at his door, confronting him, saying, David, you have sinned. You're guilty. And he goes on to say here, it says, you struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own wife. You murdered him with the Ammonite sword. Now therefore the sword will never leave your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. That phrase, the sword will never leave your house, there were consequences for David's sin. David's good. The Lord is going to forgive David. But do you know, David's family suffered because of the sin. And when we sin against the Lord, you know, yes, the Lord forgives you. The Lord will forgive us of any sin. No matter what you've done, you come here this morning, and the Lord will wipe you clean and, and wash you clean. But when we make sinful, foolish decisions, the consequences still remain. I want to tell you the consequences of David's family. It says his family suffered. David's firstborn son was named Ammon. He also had a daughter named Tamar. Ammon, that, was, that would have been, but they had different wives, so Ammon's half-sister was Tamar. Both of these were David's children. Ammon raped Tamar. So right off the bat, I mean, two chapters later, his family's already starting to crumble right after this story. You start to see it. Brother and sister, brother rape sister. The third-born son is named Absalom. He gets mad at Ammon for raping his sister. What does he do? He kills his brother. So now Absalom has killed Ammon. Okay, that's like four chapters after. You see the families. None of these things happened before the sin with Bathsheba. None of this stuff occurred in David's reign. What's occurring is his family, even though David's kingdom didn't fall apart, his family is paying the consequences. And the thing about this is his family, I'm sure his children knew what happened. Because all of a sudden, David quickly and suddenly takes Bathsheba as his wife. And Uriah is mysteriously dead. And I'm sure the servants in the temple talked about this. And then not only that, later on, Absalom decides he wants to undercut David's 
authority. This is his, his, his son decides, I want to be the new king. And he leads a revolt. He actually tries to take the throne from David. So you see, all of these problems had to occur. Why? Because that Bible verse says, the sword will never leave your house. David's family was very stable at this point. But after the sin, the righteous king's sin, it began to crumble. And for us, when we sin against the Lord, a lot of times the consequences are with our children and with our grandchildren. And many of us here today, some of us, you know, we have such wonderful testimonies from uh, the four folks who came and shared about mothers or grandmothers. What a blessing. But do you know, and all of us have that story. Some of us have a story that our parents and our grandparents made foolish, unwise decisions. And we, even today, are still bearing those consequences. You see, the results of sin a lot of times played out and it, it comes through with later in generations. It's foolishness. And that's what's happening in David's case right here. Verse 11. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you and your family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes. And he will sleep with them in broad daylight. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel and in broad daylight. God is telling David, says, David, I'm going to expose you. You know what? You thought you were being secret about this, but this sin that you thought was so secret at nighttime, I'm going to purposely expose it and that's what the lord does he's bringing to light he's bringing shame on david's reign now in verse 13 this is the key verse from this passage how did david respond david ha could have killed nathan right there nathan is confronting this man with his sin but look this is what sets Nate, david apart from all the other kings saul didn't respond this way Solomon didn't respond this way. You know, you think about Solomon. Solomon was the next king after David. And Solomon was the one who took 700 wives. And it says his heart was, he, he drifted away from the Lord. He went after his, his wives' foreign gods. And his crumble, or his, his kingdom crumbled after him. It split, and then they both fell apart. This is the beginning of the end right here, the sin of Bathsheba. But David did something. Even though we repent, even though we ask for forgiveness, there's still consequences. The Lord will, he will forgive us. David responded to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The man didn't make excuses. He didn't try to explain away. He didn't say, well, here's what really happened. There was none of that. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. He didn't he realized the true victim of this sin with Bathsheba was actually against the Lord. Then Nathan replied to David, as the Lord has taken away your sin, he was forgiven just like that. When we cry out in repentance, when we call out to God, we admit we are sinners, and that's how you get saved. Anyone who gets saved, just admit you're a sinner. When you admit you're a sinner, it says, then the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. You're not going to die, David. However, because you treated the Lord with such contempt in this matter, the son, the son born to you will die. So Bathsheba is expecting a little baby. Then Nathan went home. That was it. That was the conversation with Nathan. Nathan showed up and spoke on behalf of the Lord and rebuked David for his sin. What do we learn from Nathan confronting David? God shows grace to those who repent. If you've sinned against the Lord... God shows grace to you. He forgave David and he forgives you. Now the consequences remain. And there's, there will be a fallout from it, but the forgiveness is extended. And that forgiveness isn't one that has strings attached. The Lord's forgiveness is free. It is no looking back. God completely forgave David for this sin. But the repented sin, it still has consequences. David's family suffers. The baby dies. David's kingdom eventually collapses after Solomon. It splits. 
David was a fallen, sinful king. Our perfect and holy king is Jesus. As great as David was, we are reminded that he was a sinful man. He had many problems. He was a fallen man. And and for us, for today, this is why we have a perfect king who's in the lineage of David. Jesus, whom we look to, who did not sin, who did not let anyone down, who died so we can be forgiven. This morning, I ask you, if you have been rebuked by the Lord, if you have had the prophet Nathan, and for us, a lot of times, it might not be a physical person. It might be the Lord looking at you saying, you are the man, you did this, you're guilty, no one else but you. And what David said is how we need to respond. I have sinned against the Lord. That is the only appropriate response when you are confronted with your sin. The Lord's the victim. He's the one who's hurt. And it's on us. David said, it's me. Nathan is not anyone else. I'm 100% guilty of this situation. And this morning, the Lord is asking you, and through various people, through the sermon, through, throughout things that happen throughout your week and your month, if you have done something wrong, God might bring a Nathan, He might bring a pastor, He might bring a spouse, He might bring a child, that he could, they are speaking biblical truth, saying you have broke the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th commandment. And our only response is, Lord, I have sinned against you. I am guilty. And because of the Lord's mercy, He forgives us. If that is you this morning, if God has confronted you because of your sin, our only appropriate response is what David said, I have sinned against the Lord. We cry and call out to God, and we ask Him to save us, to forgive us, to restore us. God did restore David. He did not die. And many bad things happened following this. But he spared his life because of his sin. It is only because of the mercy of God that we live each and every day. We are thankful for the Lord for what he has done. Because we are just like David. We have sinned. We have broken these Ten Commandments. We have transgressed God's righteousness. And our only response is the Lord, Lord, I have sinned against you. Please redeem me. I'm going to lead us in a sinner's prayer. Because this teaches us that we are to cry out to God. Maybe God is speaking to you this morning and you have been confronted with sin. David met Nathan, who was speaking on behalf of God. And the, you have met the Bible this morning. And through the Bible, God is speaking to you. So I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And if you want to get saved this morning, you pray along with me. You pray this prayer of repentance. You pray it silently. God can read your heart. He knows the secret things. He knew what David did in secret, and he brought it out to light. We call out to God, maybe secretly, but then we publicly proclaim him. Dear Jesus, Lord, I'm a sinner. I have broken your law. Lord, I stand before you guilty, in need of a Savior. Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on a cross. Thank you for being resurrected. Lord, from this day on, I'm living for you. In Jesus' name I pray. With every head bowed and every eyes closed, don't look up right now. I want to encourage you. If you said that prayer, we're going to close this wonderful Memorial Day worship service with an invitation. And I want to invite you to boldly respond to God. You come forward and talk to me or one of our deacons. And you make it public. Christ calls us publicly to follow him. Amen. All right, you can look up now. The Bible teaches us. If you cry and call out to God, you can be saved. If you said that prayer, you've been born again. And Jesus Christ restores you. So we're going to close with our invitation. I'm going to invite everyone to stand up. We're going to sing Only Trust Him in our songbook 465 in our hymn book. I'll be standing down front. You come take my hand. You take one of our other deacons' hand, and we respond to God this morning. Let's sing together. Come, every soul, my sin afraid. There's mercy with the Lord, and He will 
surely give you rest by trusting in his word. Only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you. shed his precious blood, rich blessing to be sold. Plunge now into the crimson blood, washes white as snow. Only trust him, only, only trust him now. save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Thank you so much. I want to remind you, Sunday school starts in a few minutes. Everyone needs to go to Sunday school. We even heard great testimonies about how important Sunday school is. I teach Sunday school, and Miss Osmond, we loved attending Sunday school. If you do not know where to go, you'll go to our welcome center right back here in our, in our, uh, in our lobby here, and you see some folks, and they will lead you to which Sunday school class you need to go to. This is Memorial Day weekend, so we do not have Sunday evening worship. So it's an opportunity this time for you to spend time with your loved ones. You let them know how appreciative and how much you love them. So it's a wonderful holiday weekend. It's in many ways we're kicking off some of that. So that is, we will be back on Wednesday night. Wednesday night's our final dinner for this, uh, for this year, or this, I guess, this school year. So they t- our cooks take off June and July. So you need to make sure you come to dinner at 5.30 this coming Wednesday, and we have Bible study. So that's um, our last dinner until the first Wednesday in August. So, all right, David. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Let's sing it. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. 